amazing to me that I suspended or temporarily stopped teaching on the Holy Spirit because we were going through the Word of God and we were studying this book as well using Chuck Smith's Living Waters, The Power of the Holy Spirit in Your Life to have as a foundation, as it were, some means of going through the book, gradually reading it and applying it and understanding it as the Spirit of God would give us comprehension to having a foundation to talk about what's written, but then also to add to and not subtract from who the person of the Holy Spirit actually is, what his function does in the life of the believer, how he operates and how he wants to be known and revealed. Because more often than not, especially nowadays that I've had an opportunity to take a little time away from the study itself, we expound it upon and we examine the fact that it is probable that we know less about the Holy Spirit than we think we do. It's not a great leap of faith or a lot of brain cells needed to be employed in order to realize that we know very little and what little we do know, we really don't understand about the nature, the person, and the relationship of the Holy Spirit to Jesus, much less to ourselves or even to God our Father. We only know based upon what we read in Scripture and then we interpret because we don't take literal the Word of God. I don't know anyone that tells me and explains to me when the Spirit of God hovered over the waters at creation what that means. They, they don't really explain it very well. You know, it's like, okay. Now, if you want to get into it and you want to get deep, well, we kind of get into the breath of God then. We start getting into, there's more to the physical realm than what we can see, touch, and feel. And there's more to the spiritual realm than what we understand or comprehend because we don't live there, nor do we have our being there. And as much and as little as Jesus said to us, we find out that we have to discover and employ that basic principle that God has given us in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to lean not in our own understanding. Because if we do try to think in our own means, if we try to limit God in any way, shape, or form, in reality, we play, quote-unquote, God ourselves. We take the place of God and we seek to employ a means with which Theology, unfortunately, fails in revealing God and revealing the Word, which is what the Spirit of God is here to do. And we become God-ish and we replace the unlimited, unknowable, unbelievable God I am that I am with our idea and our ideas of making Him into an image we want to create. We actually idolize and make into an idol God. No one really knows God except God. God knows who He is. God says, in the beginning, God. He doesn't explain Himself. He doesn't detail Himself. He doesn't say, I'm going to explain it to you when you're old enough to understand. He says, you can't understand me. You'll never know me. My ways are not your ways. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. As a matter of fact, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways beyond your ways. And you have no comprehension of them. You have no way of knowing them. And I like that. <laughs> I am thrilled with that. I am so blessed by that, that when it comes to my personal relationship with God, I enjoy that. I don't like it when people limit God. I don't like it when people start to tell me God is. You know, I quite frankly look at them and go, no, he isn't. He's more. And that's one thing that we realize in our study so far, if you go back through the tapes, about the Holy Spirit. We began to say, you know, there's more. There's more we don't know that we can know about what's been written and what God has revealed to us than what we do know. And even then, we won't know all that there is. Because even it says that the heavens and the earth couldn't contain all the books that could be written of Jesus. Now, what we did discover as we were reading, studying, and then suddenly came upon some awareness that the Holy Spirit wanted to reveal to us. Because 
at that time that we stopped, we had come to that perspective that maybe, maybe the Spirit of God is bigger, broader, wider, more awesome in power and might, more out there as a huge entity being a person himself, greater than what we think he is. And that we as finite and minutai don't even get an nth degree of what he really is as far as his majesty and aura and the fact of who he can be as he reveals himself. I don't think we would even be able to stand in the presence of the Spirit of God. I do believe that when the Spirit of God comes to a person, he only reveals a portion of himself. He limits that with which he really is in order for us to identify and be a part of something greater than who we are, what we are, and how we are. I do believe that all of the Spirit of God is contained in the word holy. But I also believe that all of the Father is contained in the word holy and all of the Son is contained in the word holy. When we get into the next chapter, I do believe that we're talking about the Trinity and the Triunity or the tri Triarchy or the tri Triunity Soliloquy of the aspects of the Godhead being that it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and yet still one and yet still three in one and yet three separate entities unique and distinctive unto themselves yet incorporated into themselves that they still operate and function as one. Interesting concept. Now, I do believe that it's not that impossible to understand, but I do believe that it requires sometimes a background in science fiction, maybe, or a background in reading fiction, or a background in imagination. Because when we hear the song, I can only imagine, we start to imagine things. We, I can only imagine what it'll be like on that day when we're standing face to face. And every man begins to project his own picture of what that'll be like. Every woman begins to see something different. Every person begins to use their own imagination to create an image of that moment in time when we will stand before Jesus. Often, that's what happens in theology. People imagine what the scripture says. They create an image or a, a imagination. Not imagination, but a imagination. Imagination means to create an image or a mag or a entity of this what we're trying to conceptualize and bring into reality of existence in their own thought process. With a limited mindset, we really can't imagine who, what, where, how, or why God is. But God has said, you don't have to. You can't know me. I don't expect you to know me. You never will know me. But if you will understand this principle I'm about to give you, then you'll comprehend better what I am trying to do, what I am saying to you, and how you should live your life accordingly. And we learn that the Holy Spirit of God was that concept that we were given because we don't really know quite bluntly what that means when we say the Holy Spirit. I mean, we've been reading this book for a while now. You know, it's, uh, We're into chapter only two. <laughs> and we've been doing, I guess, maybe 10 or 12 or 20 tapes on this. I don't know. We've gone pretty far, you know, into the nether world. But... When you realize that there's so much involved with who he is, that he doesn't speak of himself, that he doesn't reveal himself, that he doesn't want to be known, that he doesn't want to be seen, that he doesn't want to be heard, he will then make manifest to us what the reality of God operating as one is because he will not speak of himself, but he will reveal Jesus. We are told that by Jesus. If we deny that fact, we will be misled by the current phase and phrase that is out in Pentecostalism and this whole idea of what John MacArthur likes to call strange fire because he's trying to identify some errant behaviors that come about by way of emotional devotion to something you don't comprehend. There are people in the area and arena of discussing the Holy Spirit that really don't know what they're talking about. They'll say, the presence. Well, no, it's not the presence. It's the person. Sorry. 
the Spirit of God is a spirit, but he is a spirit person. In other words, English, as rough as it is, we use the word person to identify personage. That means that they have individuality, personality, intelligence, intellect, independence in the sense of there can still be interdependence but the reality of it is that there is cognizance within itself to be separate from the whole. In other words, there's an individuality that identifies itself and is where, well aware of being able to operate individually as well as corporately. And so we get all these words playing around in order to comprehend something that we really can't, which is how do they become one. We can understand how they're three. We don't understand how they're one. And that's why when we get into the Trinity, we'll begin to discuss this in more in depth as we've already been in a lot of like, wow, depth. Jewish studies, when it comes to the Elohim, of the nature and the aspects of God himself, of the very manifest words that are written in the Torah, have dealt with this subject ad infinum. They haven't just discussed about the plurality of God or the triunity. They've discussed the seven nature of the Spirit. They've discussed that there could be nine or ten you know, realities of what we see or perceive or understand. I think it's up to like 120 or something like that, the perspectives of what you could see as far as looking at the one God. And yet still be one God. So it's interesting that Jewish culture has dealt with this subject and Jewish sages as well as Jewish theology has already discussed this ad infinum in long detail, great intellect, great intelligence, without it ever having the New Testament to be involved in and with. And he had come to much of the same conclusions that Jesus spoke of. Because even when the Messiah was to come, they were saying Moshiach will be that God with us. They didn't say he was it was God with us, it will be that God with us. They didn't know what it was. They don't know what God with us means, per se. And even today, we say we know what God with us means, and we really don't. God with us was Jesus in the midst of his people. But God is with us today. And it means the same thing, yet two different, completely separate definitions. Do you understand that? God with us was when Jesus walked on the earth with the disciples. That was God with us. Oh, well that was the physical Jesus that was with him, so it was obvious God with us. But also, because God is in us, because God has given us his spirit, because of lots of reasons that we understand, the same sentence is true today. God is with us. God with us. God with us then, God with us now. It doesn't terminate the existence of God as being separate, but there has to be more to this expression, God with us, than meets the eye. It can't be definition number one without applying the circumstance number two. It can't be definition number two without having included the circumstance of number one. In other words, both have to be true because we know that the volume of the book speaks of Jesus and that we're told that let every man be found a liar but the word of God remain true. So we take as our predicate for everything we understand about the Holy Spirit, about God, about the Son, about the Father, about anything that we are discussing or relating information to has to fit in the volume of Scripture without contradiction. I know for a fact that, you know, I hear all the time, very much so, you know, contradictory statements by Christian theologists or those who are playing in doctrines in theology that will state something categorically. This is true. Really. Can I show you where it contradicts some other this is true statement? Can I show you where you have contrary and conflicting devotional scriptures that are meant to be conflicting unless you can take more to the table than what you think you know about one part of the reality of God? You have to include the triunity of God. You have to include all of the aspects of God when you're trying to understand any part of God. Because to understand the Spirit of God, you have to know Jesus. You can't understand the Spirit 
except that the Spirit of God revealed it to you, and the Spirit of God was meant to reveal Jesus, so if you don't know Jesus, there's no way you would understand, comprehend, or have any relationship with the Spirit of God. That's why the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually discerned. How can you even get spiritually discerned if you do not already have a salvation experience that God has provided for you and to you through His very own Son? So in order to have salvation, to be able to appreciate and understand and comprehend the things of the Spirit, to have that with nature within you that He would give you eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand or a mind to comprehend, you would have to have a relationship with Jesus that He would have asked the Father to send to you His Spirit and you would have interacted with Jesus to receive that same Spirit with which you would say, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. Not just give me you know, a comforter. Because the Holy Spirit will comfort you externally. But internally, you need to receive what they used to call the baptism of the Holy Spirit because it was an internalization of an external re realization of the nature of God cleansing you from all unrighteousness. Because except that you become holy, you can't know God. It's interesting, huh? If you think about it, if you know the scriptures well enough, I just used a whole bunch of scriptures from every different portion of the Bible and just now thinking about it, I'm going... Wow, that must have been the Holy Spirit doing it because I wouldn't have thought of it how to do it. But from, we just went through the prophets and we went into some of the writings and then we also jumped into Jesus, you know, about any of the Gospels. And then we also kind of hit a little bit of Hebrews, a little bit of Romans, and then kind of tash, dash and kind of some similarities to the scriptures that are being spoken of in the book of Revelation as we know those are what is and what shall be and what shall be hereafter. So, we realize as we're going through this book, you know, it's again, it's Living Waters, you know, it's it's our foundation text, it's our textbook for setting the environment for us to understand what it is that God wants us to realize, for what God wants us to appreciate about Himself and about how that appreciation and realization of the Word of God is going to point us to and direct us to the very nature not just of God himself but of the Son of God who died for us. We're going to see by studying the Holy Spirit the Son of Man as he is revealed and the Son of God as he is revealed. How can the duality of God, the Son be so easily acceptable, which it isn't and yet the triunity of God, so rejected by some that they can't comprehend that the same thing is true about Jesus being the Son of Man and the Son of God. And how could he become sin, who knew no sin, and yet we state he is sin, incarnate, as he is God incarnate. How can that be? A hundred percent human, a hundred percent God. A hundred percent sin, a hundred percent righteousness. Who could do such a thing? And that's the answer to the book. Only God. And so, a lot of what we say and do and understand and comprehend in reading this book is the fact that only God can make it real in your life. Only the Holy Spirit could possibly give you the comprehension to take this book and make it real in your life for the necessity of living in these latter days that there is so much false doctrine teaching and misappropriation of scripture and misapplication that unfortunately it caused even some that are in Christendom to stumble and fall. The teachings of the Holy Spirit and the teachings about the Spirit of God have caused one man I know of a major faith and a denomination to stumble. He hasn't fallen but he's stumbled and he's almost fallen because he's condemning all those that know the Spirit of God and by the Spirit of God are being led. He would rather err on the side of quote-unquote, legality, than to operate in the aspect of the grace that God has given us by way of His Spirit. So, we ought to do those things that work for and move us towards God in a more intimate and personal way so we comprehend what is the fullness of God, that we might maturate into the completeness of the holiness of God, that we would understand and know who God is, 
what he is and how he operates. Who God is is the Father. What God is is, the son, is love and the Son. And how he operates is by his Spirit. I mean, it just kind of boils down to plasters, but it really works that way. So, Father, I thank you that you have so arranged our lives to bring us back to, at this time with Chuck Smith leaving us behind, the study of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. Not the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God that hovered above the waters. The Spirit of God that Jesus was filled with to overflowing. The Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. The Spirit of God that reveals Jesus. The Comforter that has come. And that He who hinders, that is hindering that work which is going on in the world of evil and darkness, as being held back by the light and by the power of God, of who you are, Spirit. So, Spirit of God, I pray, not specifically to you, but that through you, you would reveal Jesus to us, that we could ask the Father to have you help us to understand. Spirit of God, I ask that you would begin to rearrange our molecules, our our mindsets of those things with which we are limiting and we have put blinders on ourselves and stoppers in our ears that have limited in any way, shape, or form the very nature of God Himself and created in some ways idols and idolizing what we think about God as opposed to what God has said about Himself. Let us not err on the side of failing you, but let us be led to the comprehension of knowing you. God, let us come to the manifest magnitude of what you are in love that we might be able to comprehend how to share the minuscule aspect of that love to one another. That we might love each other as you have said we should do. That we might in some part as we learn of you have you do through us what we cannot do for us. And we cannot love as you have loved. We cannot live as you have lived. We cannot forgive as you have forgiven. But by thy Spirit, O Lord our God, you have given us the capabilities, if it be led of the Spirit, to forgive as you have forgiven us. Hear our cry. Forgive us. We have that same nature that you have given to your Son, that by his obedience, even unto death, he received the fullness of the power of God on earth, that we likewise could appropriate and have made real in our life the very same capabilities and beyond that, even more so, not just discipled count, but more so of what Jesus did, we can do should we but open ourselves up to the leading, the filling, and the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. So God, we want your Spirit. God, we need your love. God, we want to see Jesus. Enable us now. Amen. So I see oftentimes when I'm studying in these things, wild, unbelievable, innumerable, outrageous things happening in heaven that just boggle the mind. If you don't read the book of Revelation and get your mind blown, then you're really not reading it as literal. You're reading it as figurative. If you don't see that as something incredibly unbelievable that a sinful man could meet a holy God face to face and live. That's unbelievable. That's incredible. That blows my mind. That shocks me to my core. I don't sing the song lightly that says, I can only imagine what that day will be. Because I don't have to imagine. I have the book of Revelation. I know what that day will be like. I already know what I'm going to do. I already know what John did. And I already know that no one else is going to be any different. We are going to live like John lived and seeing those things happen. Now, I am amazed at how did John see all this at one event. I mean, there was one event where it says he saw thousands upon thousands upon thousands. 
Was he like up on a stage? Was he up above? You know, how could he see all of this? So I realized that there's more to the story than meets the eye. There's more to what we're reading than the simple words we're hearing. There's more to this life than just sucking our thumb and pretending that, oh, since we got the book, we know it all. We know so little that God wants to give us so much more. The mystery of the three and maybe this is a chapter for Trinity. Oh, well, the mystery of the three and one. I thought it was next chapter. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Whoa! I don't even know if you realize what that said. First Timothy three sixteen. It's pretty deep. It's got some really unusual statements in there that just don't make much sense unless you really think about it and even then it gets deeper and you start sinking into quicksand of your own understanding that you really can't comprehend it. Justified in the Spirit. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Justified in the flesh? No, no flesh shall stand in the presence of God and be justified. So it says justified in the Spirit. Interesting, isn't it? Shall any flesh stand in the presence of God and live? We know some did, but how did they? I was caught up, it says, in the Spirit unto the Lord's day. He said, come up here there, and I was in the Spirit. John repeats that over and over again, in the Spirit. Now, what do we hear here? The very same expression being stated in 1 Timothy 3.16. Justified in the Spirit. Why do we need in the Spirit? Why is this phrase so grabbing my heart? Because it says, in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. I don't see myself outside of being in the Spirit justified. I don't see myself outside of God being able to present myself to God. As a matter of fact, I don't see myself outside of being in the Spirit to be accurate about anything of the Spirit or of the things in the nature of God. And I think about that particularly right now in these latter days when there was this huge division now caused by a man that I believe is just having some spiritual hiccups. You know, he's kind of going through a, a spiritual jealousy phase. You know, he's done it before and I'm sure he's going to do it again where there's this kind of like what we call ministerial jealousy where they want to have more, they want to do more, they want to be the big cheese. Even though they are, in their own right, big cheeses in their you know, playpen of what God has given them in ministry. But they want more. They see someone else, they say, well, I don't like what Billy Graham's got, I'm going to knock him. I don't like what those guys got, I'm going to knock them. And then they begin to add to that. God may have said to John MacArthur about Strange Fire, hey, that George, whoever George may be, is using Strange Fire. But instead of staying with the content, the context, and the perspective that God was trying to reveal to Mr. MacArthur, he went and included more than what God told him. And I know that for a fact. That's easy. It doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. He kept adding more and adding more. And even when it was beginning to get closer to the time of having this conference, he kept adding more and adding more. It got to be where it's like, wow, you just like the sound of your own condemning other people? So in these latter days, it's important that we realize that in the Spirit is where we were saved. In the Spirit is where we grow. In the Spirit is where we will know. And in the Spirit is where we will go. Because we will go to a spiritual dimension. We will go to a reality that goes outside of the existence of our physical plane here on earth. We operate in an area that deals in certain dimensions and they are very few in number. But according to Nachmanides and according to Rambam that there is much more than three dimensions. And then Einstein came along and said, yeah, there's four or five. He came up with, I think, seven or eight. And I forget, I think there's ten or twelve. It might be twelve dimensions, I don't remember. But the, 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 if you want to know where it's at, read Chuck Messer, listen to his first tape you know, on the, whatever, the Bible, 24 hours of the Bible discusses that and then he discusses it when he goes through Genesis he discusses it over and over again he keeps telling you how many dimensions there are it's fascinating interesting study 
You know, just because you don't get the idea of dimension doesn't mean you shouldn't read and understand that. Otherwise, you're playing stupid by being stupid. That's all. Very simple. You can comprehend because we're told that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally. What's the wisdom, God, about this dimension? And God will explain it to you in some way, shape, or form that will come along in your day or in your way at some point in time to reveal to you what that dimension is and how it works and what dimensions are. So, in today's world, I read 1 Timothy 3.16 and I'm amazed. And without controversy, without controversy, you can't change this. You can't rearrange it. You can't make any other statement to take from, add to, or deny the fact of the mystery of godliness is great. It's awesome, is what it really means. When they use the words like this and they put a colon there, and they say, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, it's saying, oh, wow, look how over overwhelmingly more there is to godliness than we ever thought of, could comprehend, or that we could ever imagine. How awesome is godliness and how wonderful it is to see this godliness that there's not even a chance to deny what it is. Because really, godliness is God-likeness. And if you want to get the simple answer so that I don't blow somebody out of the water with all my articulations, you know, that... Um, Godliness is God-likeness, and to be God-likeness is to be like done, done to Jesus, because it answers the question, Godliness answers the question that says, who is likened unto God? That's what my name is, Michael. Who is likened unto God? Godliness is, or the one that is likened unto God, is that person who has godliness. The nature, the aspect, the fulfillment of that nature of God operating through the person that what is the nature of God? It's not holiness. It's love. And where do we get that love from? The Spirit of God. You see, the Spirit of God tells us in the Word of God that the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of being in relationship, of having something growing from an interaction and interrelationship, which is what growing something is. It's the interaction of sunlight, of water, of rain, of plant, of taking these things in, growing them up at due season, revealing not just you know blossoms, but having those blossoms transformed into fruit. The same thing is true in the Christian life. It's not an overnight experience. You may have love for a moment, but the love we're talking about is a process of development of the interaction and relationship of godliness at work in you to accomplish that fruit that would endure, that would be in your life throughout eternity. That you would continually grow up into the stature of Jesus, which is what God-likeness, godliness, godliness is. It is Jesus personifying the Father in the nature of who he is by way of the Spirit filling that vessel that Jesus was who happened to be the Son of Man, the Son of God, and God himself. So God, Jesus, as the Son of God, did not do anything of himself as he said. I could do nothing, but the Spirit of God within me, he can do all things. So God could have used his own nature, as we are told, but never did. He relied on and was dependent upon the Spirit of God in him. So that he would set an example for us today of how we ought to be in all form, nature, and pattern of godliness. Dependent. In the Spirit. Justified in the Spirit. Brought to the place of being in the Spirit. It's amazing to me. I mean, that just blows me away. Yeah, it almost makes you want to go back to 1 Timothy and say, hey, let's do a study on 1 Timothy 3.16. Stay there for a while. I mean, why not? You would learn much about the godliness that we have and the righteousness that we've been given and the justification with which we are now being justified and have been justified by that nature of God in us, which is godliness. See, God in us, God with us, God for us, godliness, Son of God, Son of Man, God incarnate. What is it all about? God. 
But all of this is just a revelation of who Jesus is. It's a revelation of the Son. As the Son is the manifestation of God in the flesh, that's the best we could understand because we aren't spiritual beings. We have a spirit inside that's growing, but we aren't spiritual beings yet. We don't have a spiritual body. We are only spirit-filled to the point and the degree with which we've been given the earnest, the deposit of the Spirit of God till the day of redemption when Jesus says, these are mine, and we are created a body that has been formed for us by Jesus going back to heaven and making a place for us you know, in his kingdom, causing us to be in the habitation of God that God has prepared for us before the foundation of the world, that we should inherit eternal life. That's what shall be godliness for us, eternity. In eternity, that will be our eternal life, knowing the Son, knowing the Father, knowing the Spirit, as much as we can know. Everybody loves a good mystery. You curl up in a comfortable chair, suspend disbelief, immerse yourself in an exotic world of full of odd twists and turns, and try to figure out who done it before you reach the last satisfying page. Most often your guess is off the mark, but sometimes you actually get it right. And then you can't help but think triumphantly, Sherlock Holmes, watch out, here I come. The scripture has its own mysteries. They're just as intriguing and just as captivating as any mystery novel, crafted by the latest best-selling author, yet they are infinitely more baffling. Not that they can't be known, but they can be only appreciated as the mystery. No human mind can plumb their depths. Who can fully explain how God can be sovereign and yet give men and women free will? How could Jesus be both 100% human and 100% divine? A thousand such puzzles confront us throughout the pages of the Bible. But perhaps the greatest mystery, biblical mystery of all is the Trinity. I guess we'll stop here and as we understood Godliness, God for us, God with us, God like and done to, God likeness, God as he is, Father, Son and Spirit, as he is, Son of Man, Son of God, as he is Spirit, as he is love, as he is unknowable, as he is revelatory, as he is made unique and distinctive in the aspects of those personalities that we comprehend only in the way that we choose to use those words to say that they have a type of significant separation between themselves, of themselves, and in themselves, and yet they are interlocuted and always in operation together as one, and yet at, can be seen at times being uniquely different than each other, as the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. But they are the Godhead. And so, we're going forward in this, and we will be blessed by it as we continue to study of it, because the Spirit of God wants to reveal Jesus to us. He wants us to comprehend the transfigured Jesus, as well as the humbled servant of God. He wants us to see that Jesus was always seeking to do the will of the Father, but could only do so in the Spirit. He's going to reveal to us the very nature of how God never operates solely by himself, but there's always that unity of operation and complete authority maintained in integrity of the Father and the Son and the Spirit as one. There will never be a conflict of interest going on between the Spirit and the flesh or the Spirit of God and Jesus or the Spirit of God and God. In the Godhead, it is perfect unity in one accord. And we're going to see that in that Trinity study of the unity of God, that which we call the Godhead and of which we describe as being Father, Son, and Spirit, likewise it will give us great hope for the unity of the body of believers, how we can be separate and uniquely distinctive, created to become one with the Spirit and one with the Lord. One with each other and one with one another. You see, 
the way that we accomplish all that to give the shortened version of this entire chapter of what and how does the unity of this Godhead and this man relationship of each other to one another and then man to God is very simply defined in one word. Love. All you need is love. Do, 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 do. And frankly, you cannot love except that God is in you. You cannot say Jesus is Lord except the Spirit of God is in you. You cannot say that God came in the flesh except the Spirit of God reveal it to you. Even if you don't mean it. <laughs> There's more to life going on all about you than you think you know or you operate in. You think that it's all practical and it's just you know, perpetuating itself. You don't see what has to happen in order for inside your very atomic structure the subatomic structure where there is a positive and a positive operating in repulsion of each other and yet they're connected. It should explode apart in a fervent heat. There is absolutely no way for your literal atoms to hold together. There is no physical property that can prove and demonstrate that those atoms should be held together. Absolutely nothing. They are in opposite to the law of physics. There is that nature within the subatomic structure of the atom that they keep inventing new reasons of why it holds together. Like, well, there's superglue. Well, there's subatomic God particles. There's these. <laughs> and, and trust me, I have heard from Jewish culture hundreds of explanations and then through science culture hundreds of explanations and then from Christian culture we know that he holds all things together by his... But he holds all things together. That's what the Bible says. Very simple. Yeah, God holds it all together. If you want to go beyond that, you're going to get thousands of explanations for it. But it is a mystery. Why are we not flying apart at the seams? How can we all just shoot off into, you know, and it ain't gravity. <laughs> so, when you begin to realize there's more to this world, this life, than what you can see, touch, and feel, and that the depths of our creative understanding, not creation, but the creative understanding of getting our place to understand even the basics is so childlike, then we need to go beyond that if we really want to grasp what's been done for us and have that same ability like Peter or like James or like John to go into heaven. There's nothing stopping you, by the way. There is absolutely nothing stopping you from raising the dead. Nothing. There's nothing stopping you from healing the sick. There's nothing stopping you from walking on water. There's nothing stopping you from being transfigured right now into your future destiny, which is to be the manifest revelation of the Son of God in you, and you suddenly shine as though you were the bright firmaments in your day when the glory of God is revealed of what He has done and you are His workmanship revealed to the angels in heaven of what God has accomplished in you. Nothing stopping you. You are. And we'll see that. That's why we study these things. We study to show ourselves approved of workmen and need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth, but we also uncover the beauty and the glory of what God has done in revealing to us His Son. Whatsoever it is that the Son has done, we are told greater works than these shall we do. Likewise, the Spirit of God will take you through those if you really want to follow through with what God wants to do with you. You see, that's the kicker. Are you willing? Are you able? Because you are able. You've been given the Spirit of God. You've been given the nature of God. You've been given the power of God if you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have you received this baptism since you believed? Because if you have not, you have not. If you haven't received the Spirit of God in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you have not. You have not the power to be witnesses even unto kingdom ages to come, but even unto the uttermost parts of the earth from Judea, Samaria to Jerusalem to wherever. If your ministry is failing, maybe you don't have the Spirit of God in it. Is your ministry in the Spirit? Or are you only in the Spirit? But your ministry is not. You may want to think about that one for a while. Is your Spirit being 
strengthened to overcome your intellect, your intelligence, and leading you into following the Lord your God so you're not going by your own understanding, but you're going by what the Lord tells you to do. Or do you think you think and then you do? Because you think you can think it through. And in reality, if you don't have the mind of Christ, how could you? Who has put on the mind of Christ? Yet we are commanded to do so. And only the Spirit of God daily, and it isn't a daily filling, but you know, people like to say it that way because it's a daily unveiling revelation of what God is wanting you to do today and you need His Spirit to lead you in the way that as you are letting loose of control of your life every day, then more of your life becomes less important and more of His life becomes manifest in you. That He will reveal to you how He will change you from glory to glory into the image of the incorruptible Son of God. That this corruption we live in shall yet put on incorruption and it shall be done by way of one simple word again. By one God, one baptism, one spirit, one word. Love. Beginning to sound repetitive, isn't it? It's what it's all about. You want to sum up the book about the Holy Spirit? Revelation of love. Bottom line. Love as it's manifested in the agapeo, which you know the Greeks wanted to play with words, so they have all these different words for it. We just use one word, it's fine. You know, you can say you love your dog, love your cat, love your wife, and love God. You know, God's love. You know, all in the same phrase. It may not really be applicable in the same way, but you know, it's still the same word. So, God, in that form of being who He is, has chosen to use and allow us the privilege of knowing a person that you should be in conversation with by allowing that part of him to reveal to you Jesus. Because if you're not seeing Jesus sitting in your living room, if you're not hearing Jesus speak to you audibly, if you're not walking with Jesus every day, the Spirit of God's not doing his work. But if you're idolizing the Spirit if you're telling me that there's a presence that's leading you, if you're telling me that the glory of God is upon you, and you're telling me all of these things about the Spirit of God, about the Holy Spirit, about the presence, about God as the presence of God, and you don't have Jesus, you don't have the Spirit of God. You do have and you have idolized something that is working in your life. Someone who wants to be more than a feeling, more than a emotional devotion of overwhelming wow, more than just simply a babbling in the spirit and talking in tongues that you don't even know what they mean when you're supposed to know what they mean because you can have the interpretation of tongues. You can interpret what you're saying. That the speaking in tongues was never about, you know, first of all, only an angelic language. It's just a language. It can be there's an angelic language. It just means angels talk like that. Some. Some other angels will talk something else. Angelic language is like any other language. It's just of that nature of angels that speaks. That's all. It's not the Holy Spirit's gift of tongues. If you have a gift of that nature of the Spirit of God working in you to the operation with which you don't know what you're saying, He's not trying to make you stupid. He's trying to intelligence-size you. As long as you're wandering around babbling like a little baby, you're going to be a baby in the Spirit. But if you want to know what you're saying, ask Him. Because the Spirit of God is not wanting you to be just a little kid wandering around think, think, singing and thinking and doing da da do do ga ga boo boo. You know, and then go ga ga do do ba ba boo boo hoo 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 hoo. No. He wants you to understand what you're saying, to have comprehension, to have the ability to know by the interpretation thereof of the gift of tongues, that language, that your words you're speaking, the comprehension of it being beyond maybe the words you're going to interpret them as, but you'll begin to at least appreciate why the Word of God is more than what it is. If you'll get over this dumb idea that somebody came up with about you don't know what you're saying, but you know it's just bypassing your brain and coming straight from your spirit. No, it's not. It's coming straight from your soul. That's all. 
It's emotional. It's emotive. The Spirit comes from God into your life and operates in your soul. Because in your soul there's a battle going on between the Spirit and the flesh. And the battlefield is your soul. And at times that soulful experience, the Spirit of God works through to your flesh and you comprehend Him in certain ways. And He is limited in His operation of all the gifts for you. Because God Himself, no offense, Jesus didn't walk around speaking in tongues. He didn't pray. I you know, go into this some crazy idea of I don't know what I'm saying, God, but I'm saying it to you anyways. No. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, "Pray after this manner." It was very intelligent. It wasn't ignorant. And Paul, in trying to explain that, explains it. But we interpret Paul to a degree that we make it separate as most Gentile kind of... I won't say most Gentiles only because you know it's Jewish, Jews do it too, but the point being is this, is that if you're influenced by a duality where it's like this or that, then you've messed up already because God is not this or that. God is three in one, or three as one and one as three, and they are three still separate as one, and one in being all of those three, and three being separate and as one. So it's not this or that, it's triune, tri-aspect, tri-unity. Try looking at it from sevens and threes in everything you do. You'll begin to comprehend why you should be able to speak in the Spirit and talk in the Spirit and sing in the Spirit and know in the Spirit and understand the words in the Spirit. Because it's a spiritual capability and ability to pray directly bypassing the tongue, so to speak, to God Himself. And it's not even the interpretation that the Holy Spirit's doing, which is groanings. But it makes you feel good. So it's a soulful, it's a soulful, purely soulful experience. Unless you add to it your gift from the Holy Spirit that you've not opened up yet of the interpretation of tongues. Because you'll probably be blessed once you find out what you've been saying. You'll probably discover God's been talking to you through your mouth that you just haven't been listening because you don't know what you're saying. If you knew what he was saying, you'd understand what he's speaking. Then you would probably hear Jesus speaking to you. So don't tell me you haven't heard his voice if you're speaking in tongues. You probably just haven't paid attention to all the gifts of the Spirit. Dare I say more? Father, I thank you that you have so arranged it that you have removed it from the wise and gave stupid people like me the understanding that nothing that I say, nothing that I know, and nothing that I have ever experienced has ever come from my intelligence, but that all of it has been directive and reflective of your Spirit working in me to accomplish the purpose of giving out the knowledge of Jesus Christ, your Son, of the Yeshua Mashiach, of the Moshiach, of the Messiah, of that person the Gentiles would trust in and the Jews would know that he would be the brother to the Jew and he would be the Lord to the Gentile, but that he would be the oneness of bringing the Jew and the Gentile together as one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. For godliness is our righteousness in the Spirit and of that Spirit we have been made sons and daughters of God and we thank you by your Spirit and we bless you in the Spirit and of the Holy Spirit, that Spirit of God that was at work at creation, that shall be at work at the new creation. We ask, O oh Spirit of God, to recreate us and make us into the image of who you know intimately, that you filled personally, that you raised from the dead, O oh God. And as God, we thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit for teaching us today your word, your will, and your way. Because God, we want to see you. We want to know you. We want God to love you.